So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, as introduced, I'll be mainly talking about Red Supergiants. Um, the overview of this talk follows the book that I wrote on Red Supergiants a couple of years ago, but it'll be hitting on some highlights of these stars and also looking at new questions that we're trying to ask about them. The title itself, so this magnifying glass for stellar theory, is actually cribbed from a quote from Kippenhahn and Weigert's book on stellar evolution. And in that, they describe red supergiants and other evolved massive stars as magnifying glasses because, as they put it, they relentlessly reveal the faults of earlier calculations when modeling stellar evolution. But it's what makes them really interesting stars to study because if we've put the ingredients for a star together right and then tried to model it and look at how it evolves and dies, this tends to be the stage where we really see if the assumptions we've made are correct and where we start revealing new questions that we might want to ask. So before I get started on the science of red supergiants, I wanted to acknowledge the um, research group members that I've been working with, um, presuming that the, there we go, the clicker will work. So these are the folks in the massive stars group at the University of Washington. Um, I'll be talking about most of the um, people on, on the screen's research at some point during the talk. There are a couple updates to give to the group. So um, Jamie Lomax is now a faculty member at the um, US Naval Academy. Locke Patton is now a graduate student at Harvard. And Aislinn Wallach is now a graduate student at BU. Everybody else is still at UW. Um, Brooke Desenzo, I did want to point out, is somebody who started with wor working with me as a high school student and is now continuing her work on red supergiants in the infrared. So to start off, I wanted to talk about what red supergiants actually are. So if we take an HR diagram and we populate it with massive stars, and we can highlight some of the main regions of the diagram that we're familiar with. So the main sequence, what we tend to refer to as giants, and then this strip of stars along the top, this is the regime where we'll be focusing today on the actual supergiants, so massive stars that are born with at least eight times as much mass as our sun and follow a very different and very distinct evolution to the lower mass counterparts. So the way that red supergiants come about is they're the helium-fusing descendants of moderately massive stars. You'll start out with a star on the main sequence that at some point runs out of hydrogen to fuse in its core. Its core then starts contracting, and it evolves almost perfectly horizontally across the HR diagram, following this very basic relation between luminosity, radius, and temperature. Its luminosity is staying the same. Its temperature is rapidly plummeting. So we see the star start to slowly grow. It has a very brief moment where it passes through the middle of the HR diagram, and we would call it a yellow supergiant. And then it eventually winds up here, fusing helium as a red supergiant. A few things to keep in mind about these. This is the coldest and physically largest stage of massive star evolution. Red supergiants are also very distinct from red giants. This is a correction that I make to people, and it usually sounds like you're being super pedantic because you're fighting about giants and supergiants, but this is really the fault of astronomers being awful at naming things. Red giants are much lower mass. They have much longer lifetimes. They undergo different evolutionary pathways. They have different interior structures, whereas red supergiants are the massive sort of visual counterparts to red giants. So they may look very similar, and the names are frustratingly similar, but they're two very discrete set different parts of stellar evolution. Red supergiants are the end phase or, in some cases, an intermediate stage in massive star evolution. Sometimes the stars will die here. They'll spend time as red supergiants and then produce core collapse supernovae. We've observed uh, red supergiants as the progenitors of type 2Ps. Sometimes they'll also shed mass and actually start evolving back to the left on the HR diagram. Their outer layers will get stripped off. They'll briefly pass through that yellow supergiant regime again, and they'll wind up somewhere over my head as Wolf Ray A stars, which is a different end phase for massive star evolution that we believe are the progenitors of stripped envelope supernovae. So we can trace out the evolution that the star just followed, and we now have an evolutionary track for a 20 solar mass star. Assembling a bunch of these together gives us a theorist version of the HR diagram, where we're plotting out the evolutionary tracks of all the stars that should at some point in their lives pass through a red supergiant phase. So going from about eight, 12-ish solar masses down at the bottom to 40 solar masses at the top. Um, for that horizontal evolution, going both left and right, it's on the order of 100,000 years. 
So this is why yellow supergiants wind up as a very rare population. They simply spend very little time hanging out as yellow stars. So once you've placed all of the evolutionary tracks on here, you've got a nice summary of what these stars' exteriors are doing during their lives. And you can highlight where the red supergiants actually land. So they populate this very narrow strip on the right-hand side of the HR diagram that you know as the Hayashi limit. So this is basically the limit beyond which a star cannot get colder and remain in hydrostatic equilibrium. So I'll come back to this limit in a little bit, but I did also want to look at what's going on in the star's interiors. So this is a Kippenhahn diagram for a red supergiant. We've got time on the x-axis and mass fraction on the y-axis. And you can see it move from its main sequence regime where it's fusing hydrogen in its core, this is for about a 15 solar mass star, to the red supergiant phase where we have helium fusion going on in the core or in a shell, and then this big, puffy, extended envelope that's very convective. I think they were illustrating convection with the little parentheses. What this winds up meaning, if you look at the star from the outside, sort of combining the interior physics and what we know about the exteriors, is that red supergiants look like this. The scale heights are incredibly large in that big, puffy, convective atmosphere, and the convection speeds are very fast. They can actually become supersonic. So what you wind up with is a star that almost looks like it's boiling away from the inside. There's a handful of convected regions that are the size of the radius of the star. You can imagine what kind of havoc this winds up wreaking on what their light curves look like and what the variability of these stars look like. But it gives you a sense of what happens when you stick together the interior and exterior components of red supergiants. So red supergiants are cool, literally. They're fun for me to study, but it's always important to make the argument of who actually cares about red supergiants. They're big, they're puffy, they're cold, they're massive, they make supernovae. Maybe if we care about core collapse objects, these would be interesting, but who really cares? I would argue that you do. Everybody in the room cares about red supergiants, whether you knew it or not. If you're interested in any of the topics listed on the screen, red supergiants play a key role in this. And this ranges from the full spread of stellar evolution from when these stars were born to when they die to what we know massive stars do to their environments, whether we're talking about chemical enrichment or dust production or make, serving as the progenitors of um, compact objects. So I'll be going through first some of the challenges that we're facing in using red supergiants to study these different topics and answer these questions. And then at the very end, I'll come back to these briefly and sort of go through highlight questions that red supergiants have caused us to pose in a few different areas. Our first challenge is getting a good understanding of red supergiant temperatures. I'd highlighted this region of the HR diagram before. We know that when red supergiants are in their most evolved state and when they're sitting here, fusing helium, they are very cold. They should lie precisely along the Hayashi limit on the HR diagram. The problem that we ran into for a long time is that red supergiants actually landed here. They landed to the left of, or sorry, to the right of the Hayashi limit in this sort of forbidden region where stars should not remain in hydrostatic equilibrium. So if we put a Milky Way population of massive stars there in the early 2000s, this is where they sat. And the immediate reaction of all the observers was, well, clearly this is the theorists' fault. Clearly the, clearly the theorists have made mistakes with these evolutionary tracks. They just need to turn whatever knobs they can turn and push them a little over to the right, because of course our data points are above reproach, and these red supergiant temperatures must be perfect. Uh, they weren't. These temperatures were not perfect in the slightest, and in fact, they were based off some very rough estimates of how cold we thought red supergiants should be. We were able to do interferometry of maybe a handful of stars and get direct temperature measurements just because they're so rare and we don't have many in the local volume. People were doing things like taking red giant effective temperature scales and just subtracting 400 because I think it sounded good and saying, all right, now we've got red supergiant temperatures. Okay, so these are fitting from a, from a no. <laughs> this was occasionally fitting from an SED, uh, most often just fitting from colors. So trying to, yeah. So trying to estimate from B minus V or V minus R, or literally taking a red giant scale, and I assume going 400 sounds good, and subtracting. So once we fit to spectra, life gets much better. Um, the barrier to that for a long time was modeling red supergiant atmospheres, because these stars are so cold that their, their spectra are dominated by molecular absorption. We needed good models of molecular opacities before this could be done. And that finally started happening in the mid-2000s 
with the Marx stellar atmosphere models. And you can see an animation of these models here and look at why those molecular lines are so interesting. This is an example spectrum of a K1 type red supergiant. It's got a surface temperature of about 4,000 Kelvin. And we can now look at what happens to that spectrum as we cool the star off and take it from a K1 down to an M5. You can see the titanium oxide bands appear. They quickly get much stronger. They effectively act as thermometers in these stars. If you run it again, you can see how cleanly titanium oxide bands get stronger as a function of temperature. So once we finally had a good suite of models like this, we could compare for the first time good models to spectra of red supergiants and measure temperatures for stars that were based on spectroscopic data rather than just colors or guesses. So we did this, and the red supergiants moved from here on the HR diagram to here. The theorists had done a lovely job, as it turned out, and the observations came into much better agreement and the presumption then was that, okay, the problem is perfectly solved. Um, somebody told me a quote yesterday that I loved, which is that if your theory perfectly matches the observations, it must be wrong, because there's no way all the observations are right. Um, so this starts to work very well in this sample, but breaks down a bit as you start to look at other samples. This starts to work not quite as well in metal poor galaxies, uh, presumably because our models aren't quite as tuned to the exact abundance differences. It's also limited to the optical. I've been showing you optical spectra, and IR data doesn't quite match what we've been getting out of the optical. Spectrophotometry is also really costly. You need flux calibrated spectra with at least a decent resolution. And what we've been starting to look at is other potential ways to measure temperatures of red supergiants. So one of these is the work that Brooke Desenzo has been doing with me since high school. And this was looking at atomic absorption lines in red supergiant spectra to see if we have other lines that are very sensitive to effective temperature or sensitive to other physical parameters. The plot that I'm showing here as an example is effective temperature versus the sum of the calcium triplet equivalent widths. And the colored data points all represent idealized model spectra, while the black data points represent actual observed spectra. The models blend different surface gravities for red supergiants, and we know that the calcium triplet is surface gravity sensitive. Fortunately, that sensitivity is able to counter the sensitivity of, calcium, of the calcium triplet to temperature, and you do wind up getting a nice relation for red supergiants in the Milky Way. It's still not perfect, and getting calcium triplet absorption features is pretty challenging most of the time, but one potential application of this could be with the spectra that we're getting from Gaia. The Gaia spectroscopy is centered around the calcium triplet for a very good reason. It's the way to get radial velocities. So this might be one tool at our disposal for trying to estimate temperatures when we don't have a full flux calibrated optical spectrum. Another idea we're pursuing is photometry. Um, v minus K colors, so combining optical and IR, do an all right job. And I'll actually come back to this at the end because there's some exciting things we can do with photometry looking forward to studying red supergiants in the next decade or so. So another challenge we run into is wanting to study red supergiants in other galaxies. This is one of the key appeals of working with very luminous massive stars. We're very easily able to pick out red supergiant populations in the Magellanic Clouds, Andromeda Galaxy, throughout the local group, even beyond the local group. So we would love to be able to grab a sample of extragalactic massive stars and use that sample as a way of messing with stellar evolution in different metallicity environments. But this means we need to grab that sample. So where do we start? The presumption would be that you grab things that are red and you grab things that are very luminous and bright, so things that seem supergiant-ish. So I'm about to ruin red, and then right after that I'll ruin supergiant. <laughs> Both of these are much more complicated criteria than we first think. One issue is that the Hayashi limit shifts to warmer temperatures at lower metallicities. So if you're picking a color range that you think will nicely encompass a red supergiant population based on Milky Way stars, and then you apply that color range to a low metallicity galaxy, you start missing stars. You can see how much the limit shifts with the figure that's on the right. So these are evolutionary tracks for the Milky Way in black, the LMC in blue, and then the SMC, or sorry, the LMC in red, and then the SMC in blue. And you can follow the Hayashi limit as it shifts from the higher metallicity black tracks to the red tracks and then all the way to the blue tracks. 
the effect comes from the idea that we have more free electrons at higher metallicity. This winds up giving us a higher abundance of H minus, and this is the main opacity source in the atmospheres of these cool stars. So we're seeing a um, warmer apparent effective temperature for low metallicity stars. It means that if you're picking a color range at low metallicity, you might want to slide from red supergiants more toward orange supergiants if you don't want to risk losing some of the population. You can see evidence of this observationally in a couple different really interesting ways. Um, one of these is the plot that's on the right, which is a histogram of red supergiant spectral subtypes for different local group galaxies. So it goes from the Milky Way red supergiant population on top to the red supergiant population of wolf lundmark malat which is this little dwarf galaxy that's got 10% the metal content of the Milky Way. The red supergiant spectral subtype shifts from M2 to K1, so that corresponds to a temperature shift that gets much warmer. So we see that we're actually getting way fewer cold, late-type red supergiants at low metallicity. You can also see evidence of this in the very skinny plot in the middle. So this comes from a paper that Maria Drought did in 2012, plotting red supergiants that were at different radii in M33. We know that M33 has a higher metallicity in the center. So as we migrate from the exterior of M33 to the interior, you can watch the data points move and actually get colder. They slide from a little too warm to match up with the edges of the tracks to a perfect match with the edge of the tracks. So we know that this is happening, and we know that we need a way of quantifying exactly what color range you would expect red supergiants to be in as a function of metallicity. So that makes red more complicated, and now luminosity is the next question. We'd like to know what range of luminosities we should be looking at to grab red supergiants. And over on the right side of the HR diagram, that effectively translates into a mass cut, because all of these stars are effectively stacked vertically. The easy way to do this would be to just draw a line at eight solar masses, this very gospel line that everybody's picked, saying everything below this is low, um, low mass stars and everything above it is massive, and then seeing what we get from that cut. And it works fine. We do, in fact, get all of the red supergiants. We also wind up getting some contamination from lower mass red giants and AGB stars. So that contamination quickly becomes a problem when you think about the IMF. You've got a contaminating sample that's going to be very numerous, but representing stars that followed a totally different evolution. If you look at a distribution of red supergiants from the Milky Way on the HR diagram, and now go down to these seven and nine solar mass evolutionary tracks, you can see exactly where the ambiguity starts to become a problem, and it happens right where the stars are the most numerous. So we could just grab all of them and get huge amounts of contamination from AGB stars. We could make a very conservative cut and say, well, we're only taking stars that we're quite certain are massive, but you're now losing your most numerous red supergiant population from the sort of 8 to 12 solar mass regime. We wind up compromising, which makes nobody happy. We get some contamination from the brightest AGB stars, and we lose some of the lowest mass red supergiants. And we really don't have a great way to solve this ambiguity yet. Just based on photometry or just based on simple observations, we don't have a great way of pulling AGB stars out of a red supergiant sample. There's, so oh yeah. An optical spectrum, it's very hard to tell the difference. Um, we're still exploring whether we could maybe look in other regimes. But it just looks like a bright red M star. Yep, and even getting a spectrum is difficult. If you do it based on colors, it's even more difficult. Um, so there's other things that will also mess with the luminosities that we adopt. We know that the distance accuracy is going to very strongly affect what presumes luminosity and then what presumed mass you give to these stars. Metallicity is going to come into account. If there's a metallicity dependence in these stars' luminosities, this is, again, something you want to adjust in other galaxies. We know that red supergiants very strongly lose mass. They can sometimes generate huge amounts of circumstellar dust. The star on the right is actually a star, that's VY Canis Majoris, buried inside a huge optically thick dust shell that makes it very hard to accurately determine um, estimates of luminosity for stars like this. We also know that red supergiants are photometrically variable. Even normal red supergiants vary by around a magnitude in the V-band. So if we're taking V-band magnitudes and trying to translate that into luminosity, there are huge asterisks that we would put on the luminosities we assume. And we need accurate effective temperatures before we can do 
any of this, especially in the optical. The bolometric correction, trying to go from magnitude in one band to magnitude over all bands, is pretty substantial if you're working in the optical and the stars are pretty cold. So without a good effective temperature, the luminosity data immediately starts to suffer. So another question that we've been tackling recently on red supergiants is exactly what their role is in binaries. So we tend to hear a lot about massive star evolution and the role of massive stars in binaries, and red supergiants are an especially fun subclass of massive stars in this regard. They should be the most crucial evolutionary phase in kicking off interaction in massive star binaries. You could start with two O stars that are in too wide of an orbit to ever impact one another's evolution. So these are two massive stars in a binary that don't care they're in a that they're in a binary. We'll never wind up with mass exchange, we'll never wind up with any Roche lobe overflow or any substantial interaction. Then if one of these objects becomes a red supergiant, it's at the best point in its evolution to overflow its Roche lobe and actually kick off mass transfer to a companion. So this is the advantage of these stars being at their physically largest point in their evolution. So in this model, you'll see Roche lobe overflow kick off, the orbit will circularize. If things get more dramatic, you could eventually wind up with a common envelope phase or even a merger. Um, and these mergers will wind up impacting the terminal evolution that we expect to happen to massive binaries. So this would affect things like the compact object binary population, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. So red supergiants really should be critical when we talk about interacting binaries. And it's really interesting to see what binary interaction does to massive star evolution. So the evolutionary tracks on the screen now are from J.J. Eldridge's B-pass stellar, stellar evolution model. So these are single star models to start with. And we can compare the evolution of single stars to the evolution you would get of stars in typical binaries from the B-pass models. So the primary to secondary mass ratio here is 0.2. The secondary is 20% the mass of the primary. And their periods are about 100 days. So many of them start interacting right over here, right near where the stars, the primaries are at their largest radii and where we can kick off Roche lobe overflow. You see what this winds up doing to the primary. We're stripping off mass. It's starting to look much bluer. It winds up dying in a completely different part of the HR diagram. And we've generated a whole new population of hot stars. This gets even weirder if you go from typical binaries to extreme binaries. So the dotted lines here are those exact same systems but with periods of 10 days rather than 100 days. So they're really close. They start interacting almost as soon as the stars leave the main sequence. And again, you wind up with these very stripped stars, a different range of luminosities, and a very different range of temperatures. Oh. They might be. This is an interesting debate that's actually happening right now, whether you can actually get populations of wolf ray stars that are Roche lobe overflow stripped or whether you would classify them as something else based on how the stripping occurred. At a coarse level, they are. They, do, they are what we would consider wolf ray A stars because just like a star that's lost its mass via wind, it's lost the hydrogen layer, it started to lose the helium layer, and we're exposing the inner regions. Now whether mixing and other interactions give you different abundances is a separate question, but these all basically become low mass wolf ray A stars. And the reason that that's interesting actually brings me to the very next slide. This is a project that Trevor Dorn Wallenstein has been doing with me. He's a graduate student at the University of Washington, looking at, among other things, how binary populations of massive stars will look. We should be able to see the evolutionary effects of binarity in populations of massive stars. So the plot shown here has time on the x-axis and then the number of red supergiants and wolf ray A stars on the y-axis. The red supergiants are shown in red and the wolf ray stars are shown in purple. And you can see how different those populations would be if none of the stars in a population were in a binary, which is the dashed lines, or if every single star in the population was in a binary, which is the solid line. The red supergiants are much more numerous in the single star, in, in the all binary version at late times, but you see the number that we've lost compared to when they were in when they were single stars, way more of them have actually been stripped and wound up as wolf ray A stars. So you see the wolf ray A population get much more numerous earlier, and you see it stick around much later under the binary evolution standpoint because we think of the stripping that these stars would undergo, losing their outer layers thanks to Roche lobe overflow. <laughs> 
So something like the red supergiant to Wolf Rayet ratio on its own could clearly tell you something about whether a population has very many or very few binaries, assuming you can control for a number of other factors. You'd need to keep age in mind, you'd need to keep the observations and the completeness of the observations in mind. But these sorts of ratios really start to have some diagnostic power. We actually wound up stealing a technique from the star forming galaxy and BPT diagram crowd. So this is a non-BPT diagram using ratios not of, not of um, star forming galaxy emission lines, but of stellar populations. So we're plotting the wolf Rayet to red supergiant ratio on the x-axis and the O star to blue supergiant ratio on the y-axis. In a perfect stellar population where you've observed and counted and cataloged every star, you should be able to place a star s a, a population somewhere on this plot and determine its age, which is shown by the um, sort of vertical lines, and its binary fraction, which is shown by the lines going from dark purple to bright yellow. So a fully binary population would land down here, and a fully single population would land near the top. It's a really compelling idea and a really fun way for us to potentially test stellar evolution theory, but on a population-wide scale. So you can drop a data point like this one from Westerland 1 onto here. You can compare the wolf Ray to red supergiant ratio, the O to blue supergiant ratio. You can put some error bars on your counts and put it there and say, ah, well, perfect. We've now determined that all the stars in Westerland 1 must be in binaries, and we've estimated an age that actually turns out to be pretty good. Yeah, right. So the asterisk here is that we have to model the completeness, too. This data point doesn't even come close to representing all of the stars in Westerland 1. And the completeness depends on what type of star you're observing. If you're doing an optical survey, you're going to lose lots of O stars that, are simp that would simply be easier to get if you were in the UV. You're going to lose the lower mass population. And it's very easy to mistype some stars. So with that in mind, this diagnostic data point becomes useless. The thing that we can do to try and fix that is actually bake in the completeness errors of the data into the models. We can run these models saying how complete the data is in terms of the O star population or the red supergiant population or how well the stars are classified. So right now, if we do that and we tailor the models to the quality of that Westerlin 1 data point, the diagnostic capability collapses. We can still do an OK job of estimating age, but we have lost the ability to discern between different binary populations. The good news is that as we drive to a more complete sample, as we start to improve that, then we can adjust how we've modeled completeness. That diagnostic will start to spread out, and we might eventually wind up with the ability to use populations to test, say, how many of the stars are in binaries. Trevor actually has another paper on this coming out very soon, where he's now comparing binary effects and rotation effects on massive stars. Everything that we've talked about so far has been assuming stars that are not rotating. And when you do include rotation, you get your own batch of effects on mass loss, on stellar lifetimes, on the wolf Rayet population. And rotation and binarity actually diverge in really interesting ways when it comes to how they affect populations of stars. So as a sort of first step toward using populations to test evolution, these are some really interesting results. We are also starting to understand more about the red supergiants themselves in binaries. We know that binary evolution will very dramatically impact how many red supergiants we see, how they lose mass, and how they die. But we know almost nothing about actual binary red supergiants. So a few years ago, when I was writing my red supergiant book, I went looking for the list that someone had surely compiled of all the red supergiants that were in binaries, what their companions were like, how many there were, and I was shocked to find almost nothing. When you assemble a list together, you wound, you wound up at the time with about a dozen red supergiants that had binary companions. And they were fairly dramatic and interesting systems like this one. So this is VV Cephei. It's an eclipsing binary with an M2 supergiant primary and a little B dwarf secondary. It's orbiting in a very wide, very elliptical orbit. It's actually eclipsing, which makes it very interesting in terms of observing the B star sort of emerging from behind the red supergiant and illuminating the chromosphere. But the system isn't interacting. That red supergiant does not even remotely care that it's got a B star buzzing around it. 
The B star is actually picking up material that's been lost from the M star via winds, but it's essentially picking up mass that the star has already put down. It's not interacting in the traditional sense that we understand. There's a lower mass, or a slightly warmer counterpoint to this too. Um, I like showing it to scale, because this shows you how much littler uh, K supergiants are as opposed to M supergiants. But a system like Zeta Aurigae has a very similar system, but with a K supergiant primary and another wide elliptical orbiting B dwarf secondary. These and about 10 more like them were our complete sample. For most red supergiants, when we observed them, they looked single. And this was wildly at odds with this idea that we should see a decent fraction of massive stars in binaries and even in interacting binaries. So the question came, how can we identify red supergiant binaries? Are these stars truly single or are we just missing something? Most of the time when we talk about identifying binaries, people think of light curves and of some sort of light curve signature, but I will remind you what red supergiants light curves look like. Trying to identify binaries from their light curve evolution is essentially out as a reliable technique. What we did wind up doing was looking at their spectroscopy. So this is a project that Catherine Nugent has been working with me on. She's another graduate student at UW. And she was able to identify spectroscopic signatures in a large number of red supergiant spectra that showed they had companions. The first step for this was Catherine actually running an evolution model to effectively work out what stars should be companions to red supergiants. Red supergiants span an age range of maybe five or six million to 12 or 13 million years. So while a star is a red supergiant, the, number, the population of stars that could be its companion have to be stars that are born and formed in that same time period. What she wound up concluding is that for the vast majority of red supergiants, all red supergiants that are the primary in their binary, their companions are going to be B stars. O stars would be the uh, primaries in the binary and they should be relatively rare. And A stars won't have formed yet. By the time an A star has formed as a companion, the red supergiant is dead. So the red supergiant population of binaries should be entirely red supergiants and B stars. Meaning it's not fusing hydrogen yet. Yeah. You could potentially wind up with the proto star, but the problem is that M star just spent time as an O star or a B star. So if you imagine a hot, massive main sequence star with a blob of proto star orbiting it, um, I've actually talked to star formation people about modeling this, but the presumption is that this doesn't go well for the companion. And you won't wind up with what we would imagine as a traditional binary where you have two stars that are both fusing hydrogen that would interact in the normal way. It's really interesting from a surface pollution perspective or what it does to the star early on, but from a binary evolution standpoint, the star will have evolved as a single star if all that was around it was a bit of protostar. If we then look at um, red supergiant spectra, you can actually find signatures of the B stars. These stars are so red that we get very used to looking at their optical spectra and really everybody pays attention to this regime. If you instead get very blue spectra of red supergiants and take a close look, you wind up seeing higher order Balmer lines in the spectra. And those Balmer lines are perfectly matched to the Balmer lines that you would see in B star spectra. Catherine was actually able to model this. So she ran a bunch of synthetic models combining red supergiant spectra and B star spectra for a range of different temperatures, different masses, and different reddenings for the system because we know that these red supergiants produce dust. And you wind up with these wonderful composite SEDs that look like this. These are actually identifiable as binaries even photometrically, because you can see what a strange shape they make. So you can put these into a modeled color-color diagram. So here we're plotting U minus B on the x-axis and R minus I on the y-axis, and you can see where those sort of composite example spectra land. All of our combined models wind up landing in this triangular region. Single B stars land at the bottom and um, single red supergiants land way over on the right, but a spectrum that's combined the two should land somewhere in the middle. Catherine was able to use this to identify potential candidate red supergiant and B star binaries. She then went and got spectra of a bunch of them, focusing specifically on the very blue region. And she wound up with this gorgeous evidence for how many red supergiants that had binary companions that we just hadn't previously identified because nobody looked closely in the blue. So there's easier to find ones like this where you see a very clear turn up or this where the B star is actually dominating the shape of the SED. Some are a bit more subtle, 
but the completeness actually went down almost completely through the smallest and dimmest bee dwarfs that we would expect to see as companions. She was actually able to model both the red supergiant and bee star components. And in the end, um, her work has so far quintupled the number of known red supergiant binaries. So we went from 12 to over 100. We've also found plenty of red supergiants that appear to be single. We can rule out from the spectrum any presence of a B star in a spectroscopic binary. So these are now the questions that we want to tackle next. We would love to get a number for the red supergiant binary fraction. We'd like to understand more about the mass transfer processes that happen if these systems are interacting, and we'd like evidence that some are or aren't interacting, because right now we simply have a spectroscopic signature. We'd like to see whether there's, whether there's any sign in the red supergiant's variability of the companion, and we would love to see evidence of what a merger might look like. Presumably, most of our single red supergiants are single, but some of them have already swallowed a companion. And we would love to see observational evidence that this has happened because the merger state of a massive star binary that's already turned into what looks like a single star is a really interesting one. Yeah? We don't yet have a fraction to compare it to, but what I will say about that is that the observed fraction of main sequence massive stars in short period binaries, so the binaries that should interact, is 35%. This is what Phil Massey and Katie Garmany measured years prior to the work that's been more recently done, and when the um, Santa et al. paper actually got the data, they got an observed fraction of 35%. What they recognized, which is very true, is that the sample is incomplete. You're going to have binaries that you miss. So you have to extrapolate a correction factor. Their correction factor was very large and wound up with a fraction that came out to something like 70 to 100 percent of massive stars being in interacting binaries. The wolf rayet star binary fraction is 35 percent. So the fractions should not match. By the time the stars have been evolved, we should have seen some mergers, or we should have seen some other interactions that would probably drop the binary fraction down. But this is why we're so interested in the red supergiant one. It becomes a really interesting missing point between the main sequence percent and the wolf rayet percent. And then trying to correct for the incompleteness is a difficult task. But I think if we can do it correctly, we can bring all the numbers into agreement. So there is one more sort of extreme case of red supergiants and binaries that I want to briefly touch on. I've talked about mergers, so this idea of a red supergiant swallowing its B star companion. There's a kind of extreme end of red supergiants merging with companions and turning into something fun, and these are thorn Jitgov objects. So thorn Jitgov objects are a theoretical class of star where you have a neutron star core surrounded by a large diffuse envelope. They externally look almost identical to red supergiants, but they formed as a result of some very strange mergers. So the way that we think that this should happen is this. You have two massive stars happily evolving in a binary, and at some point in their evolution, the more massive of the two, maybe a star above the Humphreys-Davidson limit, will undergo core collapse. It'll wind up creating this very dramatic supernova. If you like animating supernova, you put in camera shake because you're having fun. And you're then left behind with a neutron star remnant of the supernova. When the secondary then expands into a red supergiant, that red supergiant will swallow the neutron star. And the neutron star is actually capable of spiraling into and then disrupting the red supergiant's core. It quickly disturbs the fusion processes that are already happening. And the model that Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov came up with is that you could wind up with a stable stellar structure with a neutron star core, a completely convective envelope, and then this exterior that looks like a red supergiant. The only distinguishing difference that anybody has come up with so far between what a red supergiant looks like and what a thorn Zhitkov object looks like are abundances. That big convective envelope and the neutron star core should give you some very strange elements that appear in the star's atmosphere. Back in 2014, my collaborators and I discovered what we think is the best observational candidate yet for proving that thorn Zhitkov objects are real. We found a red supergiant whose abundances perfectly match predictions of which odd elements you would expect to be enhanced. We're currently searching for more, and there's a lot of really exciting open questions about thorn Zhitkov objects. The first has to do with their progenitors. So their progenitors should be red supergiants that were in binaries. These might be high mass X-ray binaries, but we've not yet seen a donor star in a high mass X-ray binary that's a red supergiant. 
A closer approximation might be these ULXs, so ultra-luminous X-ray sources. But we still also don't have great models of what accretion would look like from that puffy, diffuse atmosphere of a red supergiant onto a compact object. We'd love to know if there's other observable signatures for thorn jitkov objects. We've talked about infrared signatures, light curve effects, the idea that these stars might have very atypical variability. Um, there was an amazing paper that researched what the gravitational wave signature of thorn jitkov object formation should be. It's far too weak to ever detect with LIGO, but it's something that LISA should be able to pick up. And you might be able to get a gravitational wave signature from the spin down of the neutron star inside the red supergiant that effectively gives you a persistent gravitational wave source with a changing frequency. We would also like to know more about the number of thorn jitkov objects that we expect, whether there's a metallicity dependence on this, whether we have any idea how long they live, and then what these might form after they die. It's possible that these stars could die when the neutron star eventually slowly accretes enough material to become a black hole. You would then wind up with a red supergiant that disappears through direct collapse to a black hole, which is something that has been observed in a nearby galaxy. Um, we have no reason to think that that was a TZO and not a typical direct to black hole collapse, but it's a data point that we can look for. There's also the chance that these stars could slowly puff themselves apart. We know that they're losing mass very strongly. We know that they're pulsationally unstable. So you could eventually wind up shedding that red supergiant envelope and being left with a neutron star that's rotating very slowly as a result of having spent time in the middle of another star. And there is a neutron star that a group discovered a few years ago that was rotating much more slowly than expected that they ID'd as a potential sort of thorn gov object survivor. Knowing how many TZOs there are and then what they make is also interesting when we talk about compact object binary populations. Because every TZOs that has, TZO that has merged and then died is one massive star binary that did not produce a neutron star neutron star binary or a neutron star black hole binary. So getting a better understanding of what these objects are, how they work, how they evolve, and then how they die directly feeds back into a lot of those questions. So I promised that we would come back to the question of who cares about red supergiants. I'm going to highlight three of the applications that I've put on the screen, just in brief, so that we can look at some of the interesting questions that red supergiants pose for what we're doing. So first off, gravitational waves. We know that colliding neutron stars, so neutron star, neutron star binaries, have evolved from red supergiants in binaries. From everything that we understand about neutron star masses and massive star masses, those stars will have undergone a red supergiant stage. So understanding mass loss in red supergiants, understanding their binary fraction as compared to their interacting binary fraction, and knowing what all of this does to the core collapse deaths of these stars feed back into whether we expect to be producing gravitational wave progenitors from these systems and how many we expect to produce. We also know that red supergiants are the direct progenitors of supernovae. How we interpret supernova progenitors is currently a very difficult but very interesting question. If we are very lucky and a supernova goes off and we're able to find pre-explosion imaging of the place where the supernova happened, we might get two photometric data points. You may be able to get a color and you wind up with a nice pre-supernova image of this, which was the progenitor to supernova 2008 BK. And we know that it's the progenitor because if you go back and look later, the star is gone, so it's clearly exploded. But we have to pull a lot of information out of two photometric data points, sometimes even one photometric data point. So the evolutionary tracks on the right are comparing how we expect single star binary evolution to behave to evolution, um, single star evolution in the solid line to rotating stellar evolution in the dashed line and binary evolution in the dotted line. And you can see how entangled and how much those different evolutionary tracks overlap. The little gray data points are our best progenitor detections for supernovae. And I want to point out the error bars on these. It's very tempting to drop a progenitor detection onto an HR diagram and say, we have found a 15.2 solar mass progenitor. And again with the error bars. And I'd also like to point out how much the evolutionary tracks overlap. Sometimes the stars die here. Sometimes they've actually, oh, um, sometimes they'll actually streak right off the screen and wind up dying as well for A stars, which is a whole other pre-explosion imaging arena where these models can help us. But without getting better error bars on the detections and without starting to eliminate or constrain some of these evolutionary tracks, we're really going to have our hands tied 
in terms of getting good progenitor masses for supernovae from this kind of imaging. The last thing I wanted to, oh, did somebody have a question? Sorry, I thought I heard someone start to talk. Um, the last topic was strange and variable stars and how these relate to red supergiants. So we know that red supergiants are photometrically variable. They're also very spectroscopically variable. So these four spectra are all spectra from the same red supergiant. It was observed in 2004 in blue, 2005 in red, 2010 in gray, and then 2013 in orange. So this star has had a wildly changing spectrum on what wound up being a time scale of months. We are really interested in explaining how stars like this are behaving and what physical phenomena are behind what we see as some very strange variability. We know that we could be seeing the effects of large-scale surface convection on these stars. We know that they will radially pulsate, that they undergo mass loss that can in some cases be sporadic. We see changes in the star's circumstellar dust. We know that they could be hydrostatically unstable because this star in particular slides well past the Hayashi limit and is sitting in a region of the HR diagram where we know the star can't stay stable. And binary eclipses, or binary effects, could be messing with everything that we see. There's also the phenomena that we just straight up haven't thought of yet. Another aspect of Trevor's thesis has been studying massive stars with TESS. So TESS gives us these wonderful high cadence opportunities to look at evolved massive stars and see if we can pull out any signatures of either very, um, their photometric variability, spectroscopic variability. I hesitate to use the word astroseismology because these stars are still so poorly understood, but if we can start connecting the phenomena that we see in their light curves to physical processes happening at least in their outer layers, we'll learn a lot about how these stars behave. His test paper right now mainly includes yellow supergiants, so that brief stage during the horizontal evolution. He's also got a few hot stars. Um, S. Doradus was in the first test sector, so we have this gorgeous light curve of S. Dor. Um, and he's now looking for more targets um, scheduled in cycle two that will expand what he's doing to red supergiants. There's also some fun long-term possibilities with LSST and with other surveys in terms of just getting very long-term light curves of evolved massive stars. So the last thing I want to touch on is what's next for red supergiants. We know that we've got upcoming space telescopes that are going to be very, very focused in the infrared. So we have James Webb, which is going to be launching in March of 2021. We've got WFIRST, which is going to be launching in 2000. <laughs> um, <laughs> but both of these are going to be interesting tools for studying red supergiants in particular. They'll be great at looking at local red supergiant populations and extragalactic populations, the wide field of W first will make it an amazing tool for looking at huge swaths of red supergiants in other galaxies. And we can hopefully use some of these observations to start fixing the large error bars that we've been putting on pre-explosion imaging. One example of a really fun target that can be studied with both of these telescopes is NGC 6946 and that galaxy's red supergiant population. So this galaxy may be heard referred to as the supernova factory. It's had 11 red supergiant core collapse events in 100 years. So I have a student working with me right now. Locke started working with me as an undergrad. He's now a grad at Harvard on mapping metallicity, H alpha, and velocity across this whole galaxy. We have Hubble orbits coming up to map the O and B star population. And the perfect counterpoint to that is going to be the red supergiant population of this galaxy, especially because those are the red supergiants that have been dying and potentially will be dying once we have a beautiful archive of their data. So we were able to, I believe, get one direct, so there was one red supergiant in there that directly disappeared, and they got good enough imaging of it to pretty confidently classify it as a red supergiant. All of the other supernovae have been type 2Ps. And the only progenitors that we've ever been able to observe are type 2B progen 2P progenitors, and every single one has been a red supergiant. So the presumption is that what we're seeing are red supergiants dying as type 2Ps. The phenomenon of that plateau and the sort of momentary pseudo-photosphere is pretty well tied to the puffy atmospheres of red supergiants. I would love to be surprised and have an image of NGC 6946 and then suddenly have something else die in it. But it's a great place because it's already had so many supernovae to start building up this progenitor library. Another question that both of these telescopes can address is red supergiant mass loss 
and red supergiant dust production. So there's a lot that we can get done in the IR on red supergiants, but we really need to understand the IR spectra of red supergiants. Everything that I've been showing you in the talk so far has focused on the optical spectrum of red supergiants. And there's a historical reason behind this. This is how we've always looked at stars. This is where all of our spectral types come from. We're very comfortable working in the optical. But this is the near IR spectrum of a red supergiant. Because they're so cold, their SEDs actually peak right around that turnover where we start moving from the optical into the near IR. So they're wonderfully bright in the near IR, but despite this, they're woefully understudied. We have some models and we have some observations of them, but we don't, for example, have yet the near IR equivalent of these titanium oxide bands that so wonderfully measure temperature. So this is the goal of a lot of the research that I'm doing now with my group. We would love to improve what we know about near IR spectra of red supergiants in preparation for James Webb, both from a spectroscopic standpoint and even from a photometric standpoint. If we know photometrically what red supergiants are going to look like with James Webb, we can tailor some of our early like cycle one James Webb observations to the bands that are going to be the most useful for pulling physical properties out of these stars. So this was some work that I did last year. I wound up combining theoretical red supergiant spectra. So these are now red supergiant spectra from the Phoenix model atmospheres, which are wonderful in the IR. Combining these and observed red supergiant spectra. So these are spectra from John Rayner's um, Cool Star Atlas, observed at IRTF. Um, these keep going out almost to five microns in some cases. But it means that we now have some lovely ground-based observations of near IR red supergiant spectra. And with the models and the observations, we can also take throughput curves from James Webb. So these are the near, near cam filters. If I combine the transmission throughput curves for all of the James Webb filters with the observed and model spectra, we can get predictions for how these stars should look with James Webb. So what's plotted here is now color on the x-axis and effective temperature on the y-axis. And each different line is showing a different color that you would get with James Webb observations. So the F070W filter minus, say, the F200W filter. These wind up being pretty good gauges of red supergiant temperature, and it's not at all surprising. It's the James Webb equivalent of V minus K. We now, though, have it very nicely calibrated. So if you were submitting a James Webb proposal to study red supergiants, first call me, and second, you would want to say, if we can only have two bands, these should be the two that we have. 70 and 200 together wind up giving us photometry that we can quickly pull a temperature out of for these stars. We're also doing this exact same work with W first, by the way. So Megan Kokoris is a summer student who is still working with me on doing this exact same analysis for the W first filters. We have a very similar plot now made for all of the different W first colors. But unsurprisingly, the best combination to use is once again, the bluest filter and the reddest filter to give you a good sense of the SED. If you get to pick a third filter with James Webb, I would recommend picking the 90 filter. So, this actually lets us separate, separate out red supergiants from foreground dwarfs. These are very difficult contaminating samples to deal with when you're studying extragalactic red supergiants because a foreground red dwarf looks very much like a background red supergiant. FO90W actually lets us plot a color color diagram, 70 minus 90 versus 90 minus 200, and see the red supergiant population and dwarf population split. What we're seeing is a surface gravity effect. In the wavelength ranges that we're talking about, there is actually a higher opacity showing up in the dwarfs that leads to a depression of the flux in that regime. So you wind up with a very clear separation between dwarfs and supergiants due to surface gravity effects and what that's doing to the effective continuum that you see in the stars. So all of this together gives us some great tools for studying red supergiants in near IR imaging with James Webb. We're working on near IR spectroscopy. Another great appeal for James Webb, obviously, is working in the mid IR. This is an ideal place to identify red supergiants. It could be a good place to strike, try quantifying their mass loss. The problem is our data is incredibly limited. This, in 2009, was about the most gorgeous mid-IR spectrum 
that we were able to get of a red supergiant. And this tends to seem discouraging to a lot of people because we're talking about the mid IR and we're talking about spectra that we desperately need of red supergiants so we can be ready to use James Webb. And it doesn't at first seem like there's any way to do this from the ground or with the current space-based observatories that we have available. So there is a middle ground. And you can actually wind up getting beautiful spectra in the mid-IR of red supergiants with SOFIA. The forecast instrument gives you 8 to 13 micron spectra of red supergiants. I got some time on forecast last year. I don't yet have the reduced data. I've managed to see the preliminary data, which is gorgeous, but I did manage to get pictures of actually flying on the telescope, which is very cool. We got to see the southern lights flying almost over the Antarctic Circle. So I can highly recommend getting time on Sophia, both for the wonderful science and also because this is so cool. <laughs> what I was able to see on the plane, um, they don't let you put your t um, computer on the plane's network for very real security reasons, so you can't reduce your data yourself, but you can hover over an instrument scientist's shoulder and bother them until they do a quick reduction. And just from the early glance I was able to get, there were signs of PAH lines in the dust of red supergiants. So this is interesting because we know that we expect PAH lines in red supergiant dust potentially, but we shouldn't see them in AGB stars. We have nowhere near enough data. This is one spectrum hovering over somebody's shoulder, but as we get more red supergiant spectra, we'll be able to know whether PAH lines are the exception or the norm, exactly what these lines wind up doing to the overall spectrum, and potentially to the collective photometry of red supergiants in this regime. So if this becomes a way to separate red supergiants from AGB stars in the mid-IR, actually looking at the difference in the dust compositions, which we know should be there, this then makes James Webb a super exciting tool for actually really separating out red supergiant populations in the Milky Way, in other galaxies, and really as far as we can reach with the telescope. So on that note, I'll leave up my summary points of everything that I've covered today, and I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. Thanks.